All right. Hello, Pete. Welcome to the podcast. And uh, man, I'm so happy to have you here. This is like my first episode. Uh, this is the first interview that I'm doing. And I'm just honored, man, that uh, you just accepted the invitation uh, because you're not just an excellent uh, athlete, but also a very kind person. So, man, welcome to the show. Thank you very much. Thanks for having me. It's an honor to be one of your first guests. Yeah, if you don't mind, um, we could try like uh, to give the listeners and viewers a little bit of a context because uh, not everyone is a runner and uh, or an ultra runner. Um, so maybe we can just uh, tell them some of your achievements, you know, the things you're, you've done um, from a, a sport uh, point of view. So if I'm missing something very important, you just, you know, just uh, give me a hint. So one is your your record holder uh, for the uh, race across America. Um, it's like, I um, think, uh, 3,100 miles. And it's like 5,000 kilometers um, in 42 days. So that one is amazing. Then you are two-time champion of the Bad Water 135, which is a... Uh, one of the most difficult races in the world. It's like in Death Valley, uh, which is a very hot place. I think you did it uh, under 22 hours, if I'm not uh, Just, wrong. Yep, three minutes under. <laughs> Man, that's, uh, that's crazy. And I think you did it twice, um, 2015 and 16, if I'm not wrong. Yep. All right. And then you put this amazing um event by yourself uh where you just run like i guess it was like 5400 uh, miles runabout which is uh, 8700 kilometers uh, in 97 days running from alaska to florida and that was all done by yourself uh, no non help from someone or a crew so that was like for me it was the most inspiring uh, story man it, that's that's my inspiration you you know for doing the things uh, i i I'm, i'm planning and i'm doing already and it just you know shifted completely my mind um and put me uh, my perspective of long distances like uh, you know way way ahead uh, i just was amazed that a person can run that long and uh, so many days so thank you very much for that thanks carlos yeah i mean we all feed off each other you know like like right now i'm i'm uh tracking the barkley marathon i'm sure you've heard of it yeah uh, going on and it's just i can't imagine doing a race like that so i think it's just you know it comes from it's all about perspective you know of what you think is crazy and then you know finding something that someone else does is is crazy can can inspire you to do your own crazy so it's all good stuff if you don't mind we could just start from the beginning um i mean maybe you can tell us where where are you from uh, obviously you are from the us uh, but uh, you know the story like how did you grow up you know uh, are you a natural runner or how this running thing develop uh, for you Yeah, you know, I I, uh, I grew up, I've lived in um, the Midwest and the U.S. pretty much my whole life. Uh, if you're not from the U.S., the Midwest is is what we call, they call the flyover states in the U.S. because there's not really much here. I mean, it's it's mostly cornfields and farming and then, you know, a few cities sporadically mixed in. But it's where I grew up and where I still live today. So, I'm, you know, it's okay. Um, <laughs> so I grew up in Iowa. Um, and, you know, I lived in Iowa really all the way through college. I went to Iowa state university. Um, and, you know, growing up, I didn't really have any runners in my family. Um, didn't have a whole lot of friends that were runners. It was just, I just remember in middle school, I went to um, middle school here is like, oh, you know, you're probably like 12 to 14 years old. Um, And I, I went to the cross country meet, 
um, which is, you know, just, just like the 5k, um, running team in, in the, here. And, or I guess we, it was two miles. It was the distance about 3,200 meters, um, that usually take place on, on golf courses, uh, in the fall. It's where the meets are. And I just remember I went to the meeting and they said that there were, you know, I think there were like eight boys at the meeting and, and they said only seven would run in the meets. And, you know, had there been nine people at the meeting, maybe I would have felt a little more comfortable, but I looked around <laughs> the chubbiest kid there. And so I thought it's going to be really embarrassing when I'm the only one not, you know, running at the meets. Um, so long story short, I didn't do the, I didn't do cross country at all until, um, four years later in my junior year of high school, which is my second to last year in, in high school, I did go out. I finally got the courage to go out for cross country. Um, and it wasn't, it, it was really because I did, um, my family and I, we would take trips out West and do a lot of hiking and I love hiking mountains, but there's no mountains in the Midwest. So the, um, you know, my uncle, he, you know, he, he said, you should do cross country. And so I thought maybe, maybe he has a point. And so I finally did go out for cross country at the end of high school. I wasn't really that much of a, a good runner. Um, I didn't run in college. Um, but then, uh, towards the end of college, I did pick up running again. Um, uh, I, I really just wanted to run one marathon. It didn't really matter how fast I ran it. And most of the, my motivation at the time was really just to, uh, cut, cut down my weight, be a little more fit. Um, look, look a little bit better for the, the ladies at the time. <laughs> and so I didn't, I, I, I always considered myself like the non runner runner. Like I, I'm just showing up to run the marathon in basketball shorts. Um, I'm not, you know, doing all the, you know, at the time I didn't really understand the importance of good running shoes or good nutrition and anything like that. Um, so that was kind of where I came out of and, you know, I, I, but I did, I fell in love with the distance running and, um, ended up doing signing up for, or I, I, I made it into Boston. Um, took about 30 minutes off my marathon time. And then after Boston, I just kind of got burnt out on, on road marathons. And that's when I started doing ultra marathons and that just, it felt like after, you know, doing road marathons, I just opened this door to ultra marathons and it was just, you know, everything you can imagine. And so ever since I've just been trying to tackle any type of ultra marathon I can um, but it's just such a vast universe of possibilities that I don't think I'll ever, you know, tackle all of the, the types of ultra marathons that I want to, but I'm trying to do as many as I can. <laughs> but so what was the, the thing that hooked you up, up in the ultra world? You know, I just, I kind of peaked out and I just wasn't getting any faster, you know, which is funny because I came back. You know, after I came back several years later to do a marathon and I, I, I took, you know, another 20 minutes off my time, you know, from after having done some ultra marathons. Um, but I just wasn't getting any faster. I was I was always running like the same time in the marathon. And it was kind of just like doing the same thing over and over again, you know, which is ironic because running is basically doing the same thing over and over again. But I just I wanted for me, it was, I wanted something, you know, different and, and I'm very, you know, a very competitive person. So I noticed that the further the race, the more competitive I am. So like, why not go beyond a marathon and see what happens? And, and so, you know, even, even today, I'm not, you know, if there's elite runners, I'm not really competitive at like a 50 K or a 50 mile or a hundred K, but you know, if we can get to a hundred miles or further, I can, I can start to be in the conversation. So <laughs> um, that's what I love about it is I can actually be, you know, relevant in some distances when it's extremely, you know, far, you know, hundred plus miles. You could take us to that experience, to that beautiful experience, uh, which is uh, one that mo most inspired me. Of course, you know, winning the bad water is an amazing thing. And also the, the, the transcon, um, But for me, this one is very special because, uh, first of all, because, you know, I, I would love to do that someday. 
And uh, second, because you were by yourself uh, very long, you know, uh, running uh, uh, huge volumes uh, on a daily basis. And um, I guess that you, you had amazing experiences. So if we could focus on that one and starting like selling, why did you, did you do that? From, from, uh, from Alaska to Florida? Right. At, at Transcom? Yeah, you know, it, it was kind of, it was kind of like a mental, it was like a mental adventure I needed after doing the first transcontinental run. Um, and by that, I mean, you know, most people that do runs across the U S or anywhere, um, they do it self-supported, you know, they don't, they don't go for, you know, they're not running from sun up to sundown. They're actually, you know, taking pictures, experiencing, you know, everything they're seeing around them. So, you know, when I ran from San Francisco to New York for the transcontinental record, it was just, it was go mode. I mean, I, you know, I, I, I met a lot of great people. I saw some pretty cool stuff, but it was a lot of pain. Um, you know, it was a lot of 14 hour days of running. And so when I got done, you know, I thought, well, someone's going to break this record someday. And the only thing I have to remember by running across the U S is like being so focused on a record. And so I thought, you know, I really need to experience I really need to experience a transcontinental run where I'm not trying to break a record and I can take some time along the way to enjoy it. And at the same, so I thought about just doing, you know, running from New York back to San Francisco um, a year or two later. And then I thought, well, where's the challenge? Where's the, like, I always have to be challenging myself, even if it's, even if it's something fun. Um, so that's where I, you know, when I was a kid, I came, um, my, my family and I, we, we drove all the way up to Alaska and a lot of people don't know, you know, there's a highway that goes, that connects all the way across Canada up to Alaska. And so I thought, man, that would be cool to run it. And so it just became this obsession with, you know, a lot of people motorcycle, some people cycle, um, bicycle from Alaska to Florida but I wasn't aware. I don't think anyone had ever run it. So I thought now that would be really cool. Like it would still be a really extreme challenge, but instead of running, you know, over 70 miles a day, I'm running more like 50 miles a day. So I have several hours a day to actually enjoy what I'm seeing, stop, take photos, you know, sit down at a restaurant, talk to someone. And so that was kind of the whole motivation behind it. It was to still challenge myself, but um, have something that is a little bit more mentally appealing. How, how do you train uh, for that kind of event? And what is the difference between training for that one and training for, for the other one, which is a you know, a supported race and where you have to run you know, lots of miles. You have to have a very tight schedule to, to reach the, the record. Is there some difference or is that the same? Yeah, you know, I, I would say they're about the same. Um, you know, it's just, you know, your limit, you know, the, the limiters are you, you only have so many hours in a day to run and you, you, you know, your, your body has only so many miles to run in a day. So, you know, even if you have all day to run, you know, it, 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 I'll admit it does become unhealthy if you're on your feet running and training more than three or four hours a day. So, you know, it's, for me, it's just, how do I fit in the most running, you know, while working full time and, and, and make my body as durable as possible. You know, I do, I do a little bit of cross training, but I would say 90% plus of my time, you know, training is just running easy miles to train my body to recover very rapidly um, to the point where, you know, I can do 50 miles a day, maybe not sustainable for a lifetime, but it, it was very sustainable, you know, for a hundred days. So I think that's, that's the main thing for me. It's, it's, I don't get too worried about, you know, different types of workouts. It's mostly um, all just time on feet to prepare for 
a trans con, you know, whether it's 70 miles a day or, or 50 miles a day, because it's just the recovery aspect is what you're really training for. You're really, you're really not even training yourself to do the running. You're just training your body, you know, to handle the, the rapid recovery, um, overnight, which is always, always seems to be the, the biggest limiting factor. And when you say time on your feet, like, what does it mean for you for like, uh, prior to the, to the transcon to the key to key. So in the week you would just run like hundred mi uh, miles or 150, 200. Yeah. You know, probably averaging somewhere around 150. Um, and then some weeks, you know, getting up to 200. Um, I I've noticed that there's a very fine line for me between 180 and 200. Um, that's where I, my body does start to take longer to recover. Um, if I'm, if I'm hitting a 200 mile, uh, training week. So it, it is interesting. Like I've done so many high mileage training weeks that I, I have it down, uh, down to a science, at least for me. <laughs> But I mean, um, if you are training like 150 miles in a week, that means you you go for a train, you work, and then you go to bed, and then the next day, repeat. Yep. Yeah, yeah. We, we actually got a T-shirt that says uh, "Run, Rest, Repeat." Uh, the repeat spelled R-E-P-E-T-E. -E -E. um, <laughs> that was funny. That that that's like the most. You know, I don't, I don't want to like, I don't like to brag about myself or I get very awkward when I talk about anything I've done, but that's one thing I like to wear is that shirt because, you know, it's just, it's, yeah, it's a very, it's like the most important thing when it comes to, you know, doing a run like that is your ability to do it, but then get up the next day and do it again. Um, just as, just as well as you did the day before. Did you have any kind, any kind of challenges uh, in terms of injuries uh, within the, the race or prior to the race? And uh, how, how did you deal with that? Yeah, um, the, you know, the first, you know, I, I, always, I always deal with Ach my Achilles is probably the thing I, I worry about the most. Um, you know, it's just it's a really hard injury to, to manage, I've noticed, and it takes a long time to recover from. Um, but when I did my first, uh, transcon from San, San Francisco to New York city, uh, I, I, I developed some, I think it's called like anterior tibula tendonitis, um, kind of like the front of your ankles up through your, up to your, um, shins. And it just got, it was just burning, um, from all of the, all of the, um, elevation change, um, in California, which doesn't, it doesn't sound like California is very mountainous, but Um, when you, when you hit Yosemite national park, I learned the hard way. All you do is you're just going uphill the whole day, um, from, from coming from the West. So long story short, I, 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 I developed that tendonitis that was really bad, which is pretty common with, um, ultra runners that are doing multi-day events. And I managed it, <laughs> slowed, slowed my pace down for three days. Um, but then once I was in Eastern Nevada on day seven, I just couldn't deal with the pain anymore. And, and I did have to take, I did, I decided to take a day off, which, um, you know, was a very difficult decision because the clock never stops, even if you, even if you do. <laughs> and so it, it was, it was tough, but, you know, I think that day off made a, a, a world of difference. Um, in terms of my ability to recover and come back from that injury. So it worked out in the end. I just lost a day. I heard a, a story. I don't know if it was in the key to key or in the uh, San Francisco to New York that you couldn't run on one day. So you decided to double the distance on, uh, the next day. Is that accurate? Yeah. Yeah. When I was in, when I was in, um, uh, White Horse or not White Horse, um, Watson Lake, um, which is on the border of the Yukon Territory and, and British Columbia. There was a forest fire, unfortunately, that um, closed the highway down and they shut down the highway just completely for a day. And then, but then 
that night they reopened it. Um, and I made a friends with a local police officer who was really nice to me. And, and, you know, he, he understood he, he was a, an, a runner and a cyclist. So he understood, you know, the, the desire for me to get, keep, keep going with the journey and not stop for more than a day. So he found a way for me to leave that night. And so I did, I, I, so I, I call it like a 12 hour delay, but I did kind of have to take a day off. And then I just went through the night. Um, through the next day. And I think it was like a 92 mile day. And um, by the time I finished, I just, I was just so sleep deprived. I was, you know, hallucinating a little bit. Um, and I, and I slept, I, I'm not a very good sleeper, but I slept continuously for 12 hours once I got to uh, this motel that I was going to stay at that night because I, I didn't like to camp too often um, because it was just really, I had very limited supplies in the running stroller with all my gear. Um, so I need to, so I, I tried to stay in motels or, you know, just like little mom and pop, uh, places along the highway that are very, <laughs> very spread out. And so I, I wanted to make it to that one. And so I, I made up a, a double day over the course of about 24 hours. Did, did you have some kind of goal goal? uh in your mind because if you're dub if you are making if you're making a double it means like you want to get quicker or you just you don't want to miss one day so did you have a kind of like under 100 days i want to be in the keys in florida or what was the reason for that yeah yeah the, the most immediate reason was because i had already booked all of like <laughs> it, it, it's really hard to book places to stay up there because you mostly have to, you have to get on the phone, call people. There's not like online booking because these are, I mean, these are basically just cabins, um, along the highway and they might, and usually there's, there's only a place to stay every 50 to 70 miles. And so it's pretty, it's pretty well determined where you're going to stay, but I'd, I'd already booked four or five places ahead and I didn't want to have to change that or, or lose money for canceling. And so the long-term goal was definitely to get to Key West in a hundred days. But for that, it was just like, I just got to make it to the next place down the road. And, and that's like 90 miles away type of thing. <laughs> that's just so crazy. So the, the idea of running with a stroller, you know, when I first saw you running with a stroller, I was like, this guy is just It's crazy. So where, where did you get that idea or why, why a stroller and not, I don't know, like a big uh, backpack or I don't know, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. You know, I got the idea from, uh, from Bjorn Sunnison. He He's a Swedish, Swedish man who's run across the U S seven times now, I think. Um, and he was coming through, I lived in Nebraska at the time and he was, I heard he was coming through, um, where I, near where I lived. And so I went out one Saturday to find him and, and I ran a few miles with him. Um, this was before I'd ever really seriously contemplated running across the U S. Um, and I, you know, I learned a lot just in those few miles of running with him um, about, you know, all of his gear and, you know, the, the way he goes about it. Um, so that kind of put the idea in my head, even though I, the first run across the U S I didn't have, I had a full support team and, and didn't need a stroller, but, um, you know, I learned, learned more that that's what a lot of, you know, people do that, that run across without a support team. Um, and, and it made sense because, you know, that with the back, I, I know a few people that do use a backpack, but, you know, it's just, it's all that weight on your shoulder. It just, it's, it'd be, you know, very hard to, to run. And then pushing a stroller, if, as long as there's no strong headwinds or sidewinds, it was, you know, it wasn't hard. It wasn't very hard at all. Anytime where you were thinking about dropping off or just, you know, quitting and how, how did you do to get back on your feet and keep going? Yeah. You know, I never thought about quitting once I started, but, um, from, from when I flew up to Alaska, 
Um, I actually flew to Alaska from the West Coast, uh, from Las Vegas, which was not on the West Coast, but I was out um, running the Badwater 135, the race that we had talked about earlier. And this year, you know, I'd won, I'd won the race a couple of times, but I've also done not so great a number of times as well. And that year I actually didn't even finish the race. Um, I won't get into why, but, uh, so the plan was for me to fly straight from Las Vegas to Alaska and not go home. Um, but when I, when I pulled myself from the race, I, I told my friend that I was not going to Alaska anymore. Uh, and I called my wife and I told her I was coming home. Uh, but I, I tried canceling my flight to Alaska in, in the first few days of uh, reservations up there and it was too late. And so I thought, well, I guess I'll just go. I'll, you know, maybe do the first few days of the run. And then, you know, the, I think on day four was when I was going to stay in Anchorage, which is like the only big city um, in Alaska. And so my plan was to, you know, without telling anyone was to probably quit once I got to Anchorage um, because I was just in such a bad mental state um, from, from, from not finishing that race. And then just thinking, you know, this is silly. Like, why am I going up here? It's dangerous. And so it just became easy for me to think about quitting, but it was funny because I got one day into the run and I, it was just the, the idea of quitting was just a, it wasn't even in my head. It was just, I didn't even, I called my wife at the end of the first day and she's like, so you feeling okay? Are you going to quit? What's the deal? And I said, what do you mean quit? I'm not going to quit. Like I just, I'm having the time of my life. So what changed? <laughs> was that was that the the environment like the nature or just you know just you know when you run I guess like when I run you are in your head you are like figuring out what's happening with you you know if you were disappointed you're you know trying to find out what happened and you know trying to get out of the or finding a better way to do it uh, the next time or you know, you're you're like finding solutions and new approaches so what was the reason for you to Just say, you know what, I just finish. Yeah, I think, you know, I think it was just, just getting out on the road and then just, you know, and, and like, it's like every day, you know, we, your alarm clock goes off and you don't want to go for a run, but then, you know, you're two miles into your run or, you know, and then when you start your run, you're, you're stiff, you might still have some aches and pains from the day before, but then once you're like two or three miles into your run, you're just like, I can't imagine how disappointed I'd be if I was still in bed right now. So it, I think it was a lot of something like that, where I just, I just had to, you know, get off, you know, get away from the planning and the paper and then just get out there and do it and, and, and get, get mentally, you know, re refocused and re-energized. I can't relate to that. You know, sometimes it's, it happens to me in the, within the first uh, mile, sometimes in the 10th mile, But there is a point where you say, so there is no way I'm going to quit. I'm just going, I'm, I'm just going the, the long distance. Absolutely. All right. When you, when you plan this kind of event, how, how do you deal with logistics? You know, because being a hundred days uh, somewhere where there is no big city, you know, so I guess some parts in the North, you know, you, you haven't seen a, uh, people several uh, miles or you know somewhere where you can do your groceries or whatever so how, how do you deal with the logistics so you make a big plan and you, you pick up the places uh, put it in a google earth or how, how do you do that yeah you know i had a it was very i, I had a printed off It was, you had to squint to see it, but it was, I think it was two pages, maybe three. And I had them laminated. Um, and it was just a line for each day from Alaska to Florida. And it was, it would say, here's where you're going to start. Here's hopefully where you're going to end. And, and it ended up being that, you know, like some days were 70 miles, some days were 20 miles. It just depended really on where I could find 
you know, hopefully a bed to sleep on or some, you know, cooked food. And, you know, there were some days where I had to go, you know, multiple days without, you know, crossing through a town. Um, but that sheet, it was just so important because it, it would say, you know, this is your last, um, your last gas station for a hundred miles. So, you know, grab whatever trail mix or candy bars they have, you know, at that gas station. And so I, I did live on, you know, I, I ate nothing, but I think granola and trail mix for like, I think three or four days there because there just wasn't any, there wasn't even any like restaurants or, or towns to get real food. Um, but I think that was the main thing was I, I just had a very detailed um, plan on paper that I could always reference any day and, and just look at it and then, you know, know. And I always, I always stocked up whenever I could, because you never know, you know, when a store is going to be closed or you run into trouble, um, you always got to have plenty of reserves uh, of, of food with you because, you know, food and water above anything else were the, and warmth were the, you know, really the three um, key things uh, to get through it. So did, did you feel any fear uh, during the, the whole adventure? Where you maybe thought about, you know, you were running in, in the in the highway most of the time, or you know, long distances in the highway. Um, I also saw, you know, highways where you were very close to the trucks, um, or you know, you're just by yourself somewhere where there's no help when you need some help. So, did you feel any fear, or you were you like, you know what? I'm so confident. Uh, is there's nothing I can uh, that can, can happen to me? Yeah, you know, it, it was in my mind a lot, especially going in. Um, you know, the the biggest the biggest you know danger definitely is 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 uh, humans um, and 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 cars in particular. Um, so I was that was probably the thing I should have always been the most, you know, scared of, but then, then, you know, there's other things that feel even further out of your control that really aren't there to be scared of. But like, I was always scared of bad weather, um, you know, cold rain and, and snow. Um, and then also wildlife, you know, I, I, I saw, I saw, you know, bears, um, most of them were black bears, but I did see some grizzly bears, Uh, right off the road and <laughs> you know they're not gonna 90 99.9 percent .9 of the time they're gonna leave you alone but I just I do remember seeing some some those grizzly bears and they're only you know 50 feet away from me when I came upon them and uh just thinking like I was amazed at how calm I was I, I stopped and took a video of them and and put it on social media and I just you know it was the only thing I could really do I couldn't Couldn't, didn't want to run. So I just walked slowly and made sure they knew I was there. And, um, that was really fun though, because I was, I was scared of bears, you know, for the first 14 days and I didn't see a grizzly bear until I think it was like 14 days in. And I think, you know, getting over that hurdle, just realizing there's really nothing to be scared of out here was, was kind of cool because from then on, like, I didn't have, I, I, at, at first I did have nightmares, um, you know, just about being out and out there in the middle of nowhere with no vehicle and not really anyone around you. It was just really creepy, uh, some nights going to bed and, you know, waking up to go to the bathroom and thinking you're out here in the, you're, something goes wrong. And like, it's, there's not really a hospital or anybody <laughs> within hundreds of miles. So Uh, just, just be smart. How is it? How does it feel being out there that long by yourself without your family? So maybe you can also walk me through a, a day in the life of Pete running across. Yeah. Uh, you know, it was tough. My wife, you know, we're both, you know, pretty, you know, we, we we're in, we're both very independent in a good way. We like, you know, we, we encourage each other to do crazy things that make us happy. Even if it's, you know, something like this, where you're going to be away from, from each other for a little bit. Um, and she, she came out, 
uh, to see me for a few days um, when I was in North Dakota, which is like the halfway point. So it was good to, you know, I, I only had to go like only <laughs> 50 days uh, without seeing her. Um, but yeah, it was, it was a lot of fun because, you know, because the days were so inconsistent based on where I could find a place to sleep. Um, it was kind of like a stage race rather than like the same thing every day. And what I mean by that is like some days I would wake up at three in the morning cause it was a 70 mile day and I always wanted to be, um, done by dinner time. Um, which would be, you know, 6 PM and some days were short, you know, only like 30 miles. And, and those were kind of like the fun days where you can just, you know, you can take a little bit longer to, to look at stuff. You can walk more, don't have to run, you know, as fast. Um, you know, you can, you know, those days were, if there was something cool in town, um, you know, I would check it out or, or if there's like a site to see or like a small detour, um, I would take them. Um, but I mean, at the end of the day, I, I never, I didn't like getting done too late. And I always look, definitely looked forward to, uh, dinner if there was restaurants. So, um, when I was done for the day, I'd, I, I, I never sat down in a restaurant or I, maybe I did like once or twice. Um, but usually, uh, especially for dinner, I would get my food to go because I was so particular about being clean and showered for dinner. Um, even though it was just by myself, you know, in a motel room most nights, uh, because, you know, you're, when you're eating all day on the go, um, there's just something about being clean, sitting with your feet up, um, having, having a meal, even if it's just subway. Um, <laughs> and so that was, that was, that was always my big, that was always my biggest like trademark was at the end of the day, you know, be clean, be comfortable for dinner. Um, you know, don't go to a restaurant, just get it to go and, and, you know, relax and, and enjoy, enjoy, you know, the time off your feet. Besides your, uh, encountering with the grizzly bears and, uh, having the hallucinations, any other outstanding experiences uh, on the road you, you still remember? Yeah. You know, I mean, it was mostly good. You know, there, were, you know, most people I came across were really nice. Uh, you know, I met so many people, all, you know, I, even, even in the section where, you know, I went, I think 30 days without running with anyone, um, where between Alaska and, and, uh, Southern British Columbia, you know, it was just, yeah, it was just incredible how many nice people there were along the way. Um, you know, whether they knew what I was doing or not, um, you know, some people thought I was homeless, which I thought was also kind of funny. <laughs> um, but no, I mean, there, there were just probably too many, too many stories to tell, but just none that were like really big, you know, crazy things that happened. I mean, there were a few times where I almost got hit by cars, but you know, it was just, it's just a lot of cool memories that I, you know, wrote down and I'll always have to cherish. You are by yourself that long. So any kind of stories that you are constantly telling to yourself that you want to share or are just, just random things, or are you thinking about special specific things? Um, you know, I, it, your mind kind of just wanders a lot. I mean, like, I, th I think I thought about just about everything, um, you know, and, and just the cool thing about doing a run like that is you see everywhere once. And so I was just, you know, some days, you know, if, if it was cold or a bad weather, I would try to take myself somewhere else, you know, think about what I would be doing if I was in a warm house back home relaxing instead of out here in the cold rain um so that definitely helped to get through those days but then you know for the most part it was just kind of seeing like what i wonder what's around this next bend in the road and you know taking lots of photos i probably took a photo i probably took a hundred photos a day 
um, you know, sometimes while I'm moving, cause my phone was just sitting on top of the stroller. Uh, but yeah, I just, just curiosity and thinking, you know, I ran through pretty much all, I mean, 90%, 95% of the run was out in the middle of nowhere, you know, not going through a town. So it's just, I, I do a lot of wondering, like, I wonder if anyone's ever run on this road or, you know, has ever thought about that tree off in the distance like I am right now. Um, just things like that. Uh, I thought were really cool because I think we underappreciate, you know, just being out there uh, in the middle of nowhere and, and exploring. Yeah, you're right. You, did you did you have music with you? Yeah, I, I had a, I had Bluetooth speakers that I put on. So, I mean, the stroller was amazing because I could do all these things that I normally wouldn't be able to do. Um, but yeah, I, I had, I was usually playing my Bluetooth uh, speakers on the stroller and um, which was nice. So I could still hear traffic. What, what was the hardest, the, the harder part of the run, the beginning in the middle, or, you know, were there specific hard parts of the, of the race? Yeah, you know, well, for my, for, for the, you know, for the, First transcon I did, it was definitely the end um, because my, you know, doing 70 plus miles a day is just not sustainable. I'll admit, you know, for more than a month or two, no matter how good a shape you're in. Um, so my feet were, it took months for my feet to recover just from all the pounding they took. <laughs> they were just, the, the, they were just really bruised. I think that the bones, um, But from Alaska to Florida, you know, it was, there was never really a time where I was like, oh man, this, you know, this injury just won't go away. Um, it was, it felt very sustainable. If there were days where your body like was telling you just, you know, just stop, you cannot go anymore if you had so such days. So how, what do you do to overcome that? Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, you know, I, I, I do, I think I do a really good job of, you know, compartmentalizing what I'm doing and what I'm, what I'm doing right now versus what I'm trying to do long-term. Um, and I think that's why, you know, you know, I think you, you need that to do, do well at some of these really extreme distances, because I think, you know, a lot of people, the reason they don't finish a race or, you know, finish something is because they're, Their, they, their eye is on the, the finish line the whole time. Um, yes. And Alaska to Florida, especially, I got really good at not worrying about the finish line. Like I was actually kind of sad when it was over. Um, and it was just, you know, I, I'd say like, you're just counting up. You're not like, there's no countdown. Um, so like, you know, instead of counting down from, you know, 5,400 miles from Alaska to Florida, it was, well, let's just count up you know, type of mentality. So even if you're just walking down the road and you think you're, you're done, you're still, you're still adding to that number. You're still, the, the number's getting bigger. Um, so I think there, you know, there's just a lot of ways, you know, that I, I go about it, you know, if something's not going well. Um, but I think, I think, you know, the good thing about doing a run like that is you can't, you've invested so much energy to do it. So just having the ability to do it um, is really, you know, a reward in itself. What were the best takeaways from that experience for you, for your life? Yeah, you know, I think there were, I mean, I think for me, it's just, it, it was just a, It was just a, a thought that like when you do something, you don't really have to ask for approval from anyone. Because when I, you know, when I set out to do to run from Alaska to Florida, it was just kind of like this, like, what are you trying to do? Like, this is a silly idea. Um, that I mean, I think no one really, I mean, not no one, but there weren't a whole lot of people that thought it was a smart thing to do when I started. Or like, you know, they understood why I was doing it. They didn't really understand why I was doing it. So I think like in life, like you just have to, you know, not many people are going to see your vision of something until perhaps it's already out there or you've completed it, you know, 
So you can't really just, you, you can't, you, you shouldn't, you know, turn your way f- your, yourself away from doing something uh, just because, you know, no one else sees how awesome it's going to be. That's amazing. That's amazing. I can relate totally to that. So I, I guess when you reach the keys in Florida, when you reach the, the finish line, yeah. <laughs> what did you feel when you just got there it, it felt weird you know and, and it, well and it was strange because every run or well not every both um transcontinental runs i did every single day i was running towards the sunrise and then the sunset was always behind me because i was always running east from the west uh but then those last two days on on the keys you're heading back west so i was So like the sunrise was behind me. And so that, that those last two days crossing, you know, the hundred miles of the, the, the keys, um, to key West was really interesting in that way. And it was kind of symbolic of the whole run. because it was just kind of like, I didn't, I, you know, I, I would have people running with me a lot of days, which was awesome. But then I knew those last couple of days, I just kind of wanted to be alone with my thoughts. And it was just kind of symbolic, like, the sun was behind me, you know, those two days were really different. Um, but it was just, you know, reflecting on the whole run really. Um, and just like thinking, man, I, when I started this run, I was, I was closer to Beijing, China than I was to here when I, in Alaska. And so just like thinking like how far I had come in a hundred days and like, it was just kind of a, it was a really cool experience. And then, um, you know, getting to, You know, and then the next day, just not getting up to run, it felt really, it felt very weird. <laughs> I didn't know what to do with myself. <laughs> That's beautiful. That was uh, also the, the next question I wanted to ask you. So did you have any challenges to adapt again to, to norm, a normal life without running uh, that long? Oh, absolutely. Yeah, it's, it's, it's difficult because um, you, you just like, you're celebrating and like, you're, you're so used to eating like 5,000 calories, 6,000 calories a day, 7,000 calories a day sometimes. And I just, yeah, I mean, it's hard because you're so hungry all the time. And like, you feel so lazy because you, you like put on pounds like crazy after a run like that. And like, all you want to do is just like, use all that energy that you have stored to go run again. <laughs> know that you should take you know take time to to fully recover so yeah it's tough because you're just you're just your body is just so used to saying like yeah let's get up and do it again and then now all of a sudden like you have to mentally tell your body like let's take it easy for you know a month or two all right Pete, i want to be respectful with your time so maybe the last question um are you thinking about putting more events like that or are you just you know taking all the time to do other things what's happening in your life right now yeah yeah you know i'm just you know right now i'm just super excited you know that hopefully you know all the all of the you know coronavirus you know shut down which obviously was very very legitimate is almost behind us you know in a couple in a month or two here we'll get back to, to, to life as we knew it away, you know, over a year ago. Um, so for me, I think it's for the, you know, the near term, the next, you know, six months or so it's getting back to races, uh, seeing friends and, and doing things like that and just getting back out there. Um, but long-term I would definitely love to, to keep, you know, doing these transcontinental type runs Um, I think it'd be fun to run across Australia at some point, um, you know, not too far down the road. And then I don't know, I'm, you know, I'm 30, what am I? 33, 34, 33 years old. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, 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 I'll never say I'll never do another transcon because I, I, I'd love to do, you know, if it weren't for work, I would be doing one all the time, which is <laughs> probably smart that I'm not, but I just love being out on the road. So, you know, I think there's a lot of different types of 
of journeys that I'd love I'd love to go on that are are like that. All right, Pete. So in this podcast, we aim to get insights and ideas for creating a better, more inspired, fulfilled, and healthy life. So can you give us three ways or three tactics, insights for having a more fulfilled and healthy life just from your perspective? Yeah. Yeah. Um, you know, first one is, you know, just waking up early, you know, I, I've, I'm not a morning person. I, I, I'm, I was, I grew up as a night person, but like, you're, you're always going to like the most productive people I know who are much more productive than, than I am, you know, they wake up at, you know, 4am and they have kids. So they get, they get the run in before the kids are even awake. I mean, it's just, you know, make, make your morning as productive as possible and, 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 and feed off that productivity from the morning to have a great day because, you know, I can't tell you how many times I've slept in and had a bad day that was even less productive because I didn't wake up early to, to go run. And, you know, I pushed it off to the end of the day and, and then I'm just stressed all the time. So I think that's like the easiest way to avoid stress is being as productive as you can early in the morning. Um, and I think being selfish, like that's, <laughs> seems like a weird one, but like, you know, I think a lot of people are unhappy in life because they hold some, a grudge against, you know, their loved ones because they feel like they're the reason why they can't go do something crazy, you know, like running across the country. But I think, you know, if you're, it's good to be selfish sometimes because I think it makes you a better person to your loved ones, if, if you're doing things that are really important to you, even if it, it's not important to them. I, I can relate totally to that because I have also yeah. have a family. If I wouldn't do this kind of stuff, like going for long runs, you know, I wouldn't be the father and the husband that I, I, I am to be. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, the only other thing besides getting up early, being selfish is it's just consistency. Like, you know, it's, I, I, whenever I'm not, getting to where I want to be. It's because, you know, I wasn't consistent and I, I had a bad day. You know, I, I took, you know, I take one day off and then it turns into three days off. And then before I know it, I'm, I'm down and depressed because I didn't, you know, I didn't stick with my routine. So I think having, you know, being very consistent and having a, a routine, it might seem boring, but it'll get to, you, you know, to where you want to go much quicker. For the people out there, where can we find you Uh, on social media i love instagram um it's just my name pete kostelnik um i put all in i put all my training on strava i know a lot of people like I, i think i have more followers on strava than anything else just because people think it's comical how how much i run <laughs> um and then i have uh on facebook i guess it's like pete's feet across america um is is where i kind of kind of use that with with instagram listen thank you thank you very much for your time and for taking this interview you know this is this this means a lot to me this is the first episode and having such an amazing person in the first one you know it's uh i feel very lucky um having done this well thank yeah. you so much for having me on carlos and yeah i i can't wait till the day that we can meet in person and then You know, it, until till then, I'll be following your adventures and 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 living through you while you while you're out there and I'm stuck in an office. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, buddy. I will just uh, join Strava just to to see your your trainings. I love oh, I, I love Strava. It's such it's yeah. such a cool. It, it's a much more positive place, I think, than than anywhere else on social media. All right, man. So have a nice day and thank you very much again. All right. Take care. Take care. Bye, Pete. All right. Bye, Carlos. Thanks so much.